Hi there, and welcome to this featured build of the Roden 132nd scale kit of the Boeing Stearman PT-17, the KDET. Interesting one this, this is my first ever build of a Roden kit. Let's see how it does. Although widely known as the KDET, the official title for this aircraft was the Stearman Boeing Model 75. Whilst its history has generally been very well documented, one less explored area is its link with the Royal Air Force. Although it was never operated by the RAF, many RAF pilots completed their basic training in this aircraft. This was either in Canada, where the Canadian Air Force operated the type, or in the USA itself at the British Flying Training Schools, seven of which were set up in 1941 as a result of the Lend-Lease Agreement. An aircraft from the number four school is the subject of one of the decal options provided in this kit. Opening the box reveals eight medium grey sprues totalling about 130 parts plus a small transparent sprue with the windscreens, fuel gauge and navigation lights. The standard moulding is good, with an appropriate mixture of raised and engraved detail, and the fabric covering is subtly represented and barely any flash or annoyingly placed ejection marks are evident. The finer detail parts vary in quality actually, some very sharp and fine like the engine that we'll see in a minute, some less so like some of the cockpit details. A range of aftermarket products are available for this kit. The ones I used I've listed on the slide here for you. I built the engine first. This is totally exposed on the finished model and therefore the level of detail, especially in this scale, needs to be good. Well, really it is. Some 35 parts were involved in the building plus a photo etched set of plug leads. Assembly generally went well, but there are a couple of things to look out for. The valve covers that sit on top of the cylinder heads. These are tiny pieces and are attached to the sprue in such a way that removing them without damage is quite tricky. Also, the top faces of the cylinder heads where the covers attach need squaring off to provide a flat mating surface, otherwise a fiddly little filling job may result. Also, when attaching the exhaust pipes, that's 10H on the instructions, take care to make sure they line up and mate with the collector ring, 1H. It helps to do this if the collector ring is attached before the pipes themselves, contrary to what the instructions say. The completed engine was sprayed gunmetal grey with a thin gloss black wash. Details were picked out in silver or a rub of aluminium powder from SNJ. The cockpit comes next. It's well detailed, it's one of the best bits of the kit actually, but there are still improvements that can be made. The main photo etch set provides excellent replacement instrument panels as well as throttle and trim levers. Uh, it's a further improvement if the rods linking these controls between the fore and aft cockpits are replaced with brass rod as the kit items are over scale. The trickiest cockpit job is assembling the photo etch seats. These look good but do take careful folding, particularly the seat backs, to get them to go together properly. They were finally assembled with thin beads of superglue down the joint lines. The joysticks provided in the kit are spindly and under scale, but replacing them with brass rod is simple enough. Final job was to fold and have the photo etch seat belts conveniently pre-coloured. Then we can paint the fuselage interior. Photos of the real aircraft show the framework was green, but often the fabric covering was a pale grey. As the stringers and formers are quite well represented as raised detail within each fuselage half, it's quite easy to copy that job here. Humbrol 64 was used as the pale grey background. The appropriate areas were then masked off and the framework painted green. A good feature of this rather fiddly scheme is that it does show off the cockpit detail much better than a solid green background would have done. 
The completed cockpit assembly was fitted into the port fuselage half where it clicked into place very snugly, then given time to dry before the fuselage halves were cemented together. Some trimming of the rear ends of the cockpit cage were required to get the starboard fuselage half to fit properly, but once this was done the halves went together well with very little filling required. The engine panels were added next, also the well engineered undercarriage unit which fitted beautifully. The instructions have the engine fitted at this stage, but it's obviously best left off until the main paint job has been completed. Now comes the major construction challenge. This involved the fixing and alignment of the wings and began with the attachment of the pre-assembled lower wings to the fuselage. These appear to fit quite well, but great care is needed to ensure that they're correctly aligned. This is tricky because the alignment needs to be correct in several planes. First, the dihedral. It's only about two degrees. In this scale, that means the outside centre edge of the tips need raising about 5 mil above the horizontal. Not difficult in itself, but also the wings need to be at right angles to the centre line of the fuselage, with no degree of sweep back. As well, the incidence needs to be correct. The way to ensure this is by making sure the trailing edge of the wing root is flush with the bottom of the fuselage, with no step evident. If the wings are just glued in and left to their own devices, at least one of these planes will be out. The result will be significant problems when it comes to aligning the struts and fitting the top wing. Believe me, I've been there. Some careful work at this stage will alleviate a lot of extra work and pain later on. Attaching the struts came next and also needed care. The main plane struts are to scale, but consequently thin and struggle to hold up the very heavy top wing. Unless everything is aligned properly, they will easily bow and distort. The interplane struts mounted on the fuselage have strange integrally moulded cross braces which supposedly represent the rigging. The immediate reaction is to cut these bits away, but they are useful in helping line everything up and are best left in place until a bit later. To correctly position the struts, constant dry fitting of the upper wing is necessary, together with plenty of drying time for the glue at the lower ends of the struts to enable strong joints to be made. Once everything fits and lines up, the cross braces on the interplane struts can be carefully cut away. Obviously, it's best to leave the top wing off until after the main paint job is completed. The main components were primed, rubbed down and given a little pre-shading uh, in dark grey. The yellow was applied next to the wings and tail. Opinions vary a bit as to the exact shade to use. I went for a humbrol mix which you can see up on screen here. Fuselage, quite difficult I found to get a really convincing shade for that. A lot of experimentation was involved and in the end I went for a revel mix that you can see on screen as well. Windscreens and wheels were also painted at this stage where the Edward masking set worked well. The propeller was given a coat of gloss black to provide a base for the outclad aluminium used to represent the metal inserts on its leading edge. These were then masked off and the remaining black areas sprayed with Vallejo 17995 German grey. This gives a convincing nearly black effect that was then lightly buffed to give a slightly worn appearance. Training aircraft were kept in near pristine condition, so heavy weathering would not really be appropriate. The kit decals were mediocre. The register was slightly off on the upper wing stars and all of the subject on the sheet were very glossy and super thin, which made positioning of the large subject difficult. Each subject could take only minimal repositioning before it broke up. Painting the main markings on became the preferred option. This is neither as difficult or time consuming as many people think, particularly in this large scale. Here we go, it's as easy as one, two, three. Obviously there are limits and you can't apply all markings in this way, but it is a skill that's worth developing. Fortunately, as we know, there's an ever-increasing range of pre-cut stencils available now from companies like Montex, and they make the job ever so much easier. 
However, even a complete DIY job is not that difficult in a lot of cases. Three further jobs need doing before the top wing is attached. Firstly, fitting the windscreens in place, and roll clear fix used for this, and then holes for the rigging wire should be drilled in the wings and fuselage. Helpfully, these points are mostly clearly marked on the parts themselves. The Edward photo etch set does contain some strange lollipop shaped parts that according to Edward need to be keyed into the wing and fuselage rigging points to provide attachment for the wires. This is a difficult job and looks most odd. Don't bother with them, just drill holes for the rigging and fit it as normal. Third job was to apply a small amount of weathering using the grime wash from the Florin modelling weather washes to gently highlight the various panel lines on the fuselage and wings. Once the wing is in place, a few kit parts still need to be added. These include two fuel lines that run from the gravity tank in the upper wing to the fuselage. These look complex, but they fitted well. They are a bit overscaled though, and may be better replaced with brass or lead wire. It also became evident at this stage that the control horns on the rudder are way too long and need reducing to half their original length to avoid fouling the elevators. Finally, the rigging. One of the advantages of working in a large scale is that rigging is made a bit easier by having extra space to work with. The rigging diagram provided in the kit instructions, correct as far as it goes, but it should be considered a bare minimum. Most modellers I'm sure will want to add a bit more. Fortunately, plenty of photos and drawings online available to help with this. The kit here was rigged with a mixture of stretched sprue used for the tailplane and centre section struts and hemline invisible thread used for the main planes. The invisible thread is the smoke colour and is easy to use. Slipped into the holes, fixed with super glue and tightened with a source of heat if necessary. The spreader bars are provided in the kit but are way over scale and pre-painted lengths of brass wire were used instead. Once the rigging was in place, a final light coat of a 50-50 mix of clear and water was applied, evening out the finish and the model was complete. So there we go. Despite a few issues, this kit did build into an attractive model that I was pleased with. I know a lot of people will want to know, well how does this compare with the ICM kit of the same subject in the same scale? Short answer is I don't know because I've not built the ICM one but from what I've seen of it, it may be just that little bit better engineered than this one and just a little bit easier to build. Don't hold me to that though, you might have to go online and check a bit more for yourselves. So, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you found this presentation interesting and useful. Next up, coming soon, is a full build of the Infinity Models SB2C Helldiver. That should create a bit of interest. Wonder how it does. You'll find out soon. Bye for now.